this week record-setting turnouts at the polls and a local call for peace in the face of national violence. Plus, don't miss Brennan Serrano with your Bronco Sports Update. These stories and more coming up next on your Boise State Newsline for the week of November 6, 2018. Thank you for joining us on this week's edition of Newsline. I'm Lily Crolius. And I'm Doug Mason. The election was yesterday, but it might be a little while before all the races are called. BTV's Jimena Bustillo has a rundown of the results that we do know. She joins us live in the studio. Thank you, Lily. Now, this entire election cycle saw record-breaking numbers of voter turnout, which is abnormal for midterm elections. In fact, even Idaho vote broke many records in terms of voter turnout. Now, first, we can see that when it comes to the governor races, Republican candidate Brad Little surpassed Paulette Jordan, uh, the, Democratic, uh, the Democratic candidate, and is now next to be the next governor of Idaho. When it comes to the lieutenant governor race, we had a new historical landscape, seeing as two women were running for the lieutenant governor's sphere. Now, this is the first time in history that Idaho is going to have a female lieutenant governor, and Republican Janice McGillen is actually coming forward and is winning uh, after the concession of the Democrat side. Now, the Republicans continue to have a successful night, as at 9 a.m. this morning, it was called that Superintendent Sherry Ibarra is going to continue on for another term, narrowly surpa surpassing the Cindy Wilson, the Democratic candidate, by barely 1%. Now, we had two propositions on the ballot this election cycle as well. Proposition 1 was aimed to legalize horse racing and the gambling within the spheres. Now, although this was a very controversial and almost very confusing to understand proposition, we can see that it did in fact fail as many people wanted to vote it down. Now, the second proposition was actually much more well-known and much more well-versed, and that was the expansion of Medicaid that was seen in that of Prop 2. Now, the expansion of Medicaid is aimed to open up the Medicaid, uh, Medicaid eligibility for those that are deemed to be inside the gap. This passed with over 60% vote in favor. And finally, what we can see is that although there wasn't necessarily the blue wave that many Democrats wanted to have, there was a gain of control of the House, thus leaving a split government into this next year and thus for the rest of the Trump administration. However, the Republicans did secure control of the Senate. Back to you. Thank you, Jimena. And this just in, we are just hearing about this right now, but hours after the midterm election, there was a major shakeup in the Trump administration. That's right. Attorney General Jeff Sessions has delivered his resignation to the White House under a request from President Trump. Stay tuned for more info. The 2018 election's over, but politics aren't. Middleton Heights Elementary School, located in Middleton, Idaho, has recently made national news. Fourteen of their staff members were put on paid leave after a display of culturally insensitive Halloween costumes. Seven were dressed as stereotypical Mexicans in sombreros and ponchos, while the other seven were dressed in American patriotic gear and a wall that read, Make America Great Again. Since the incident, more than 9,000 people have signed a petition calling for district-wide training. What concerned people were the feelings of Latina children. It is important to make students, especially young children, feel comfortable in their learning environments to foster a healthy education. However, it was reported that the costumes were a part of a team building exercise that took place after school hours. 10,000 people counteracted the petition to reinstate the staff members. Should public school teachers be allowed to dress in politically satire costumes when they're not in front of their students? This is an important question regarding the balance of free speech and safe environments. As for now, the school has increased security and will be starting culturally sensitive training, continuing it into the years following. I spoke with two individuals that were affected by the Pittsburgh shooting at the Tree of Life Synagogue, but they had an interesting perspective from right here in Boise. Built in the 19th century, the Ahaveth Beth Synagogue is home to those in Boise who practice Judaism. The quaintness of the building represents the tradition for the strong yet small congregation. Yeah, the synagogue has been here since 1895, and it's the oldest operational synagogue west of the Mississippi. Uh, originally, it was uh, two different synagogues, but uh, we combined into one synagogue. And we have had, um, let's see, bar and bat mitzvahs here, weddings here. 
Uh, our community isn't as large as some back east, but I feel that we're very close and very tight. Perhaps our smaller numbers make us seek each other out, and I consider this my second family. As far as security for the synagogues, each synagogue has to approach this in the best manner for themselves. But I believe that synagogues need to address security and it would be in their best interest to evaluate their grounds, look at their entrances and exits and determine uh, escape routes in the case that anything happens, whether it's fire or um, God forbid, another shooter. It's always a good idea to be prepared. Sorrow, despair, and anguish are all terms to apply to this traumatic event. But the Jewish community overall in the United States is a rather small community. And when a Jewish person is hurt anywhere in the country, anywhere in the world, I believe we feel it profoundly. And so to lose 11 members of our family um, uh, shakes us to the core, especially here in the United States. We've often felt very safe here and this has rattled us. One of the uh, people who attended our Havdalah memorial service on Saturday was the uh, chief of police for Boise Police. He, he showed up, he came here and said that uh, he would work with us on how to um, improve our safety, but that he would also be out there to make sure that he and his team would be um, an, an asset to us and, and help us to secure our measures. As we mourn the loss of the 11 harmless victims at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, it's also important to keep in mind how this affects your own community. And we here in Boise, Idaho, feel that it's important to not only reflect on what has happened, but how to move forward in a positive way. Given the recent attack on Jews in America, safety measures are called into action countrywide, even right here in Boise. Uh, for me, I would like to see more security. I want to see precautions uh, being taken for each and every person to know how to either evacuate the congregation um, safely or um, basically act the Second Amendment and take on arms against this threat. I don't think Boise will be a huge target, uh, but you never really know, unfortunately. I would definitely think that Jews everywhere should try and be more uh, proud for who they are, especially since we are a scarce culture and uh, type of people within the world. Um, I think that's like the only positive that we can have from this, that all sectors of Judaism, uh, conservative reform and Orthodox should uh, learn to just be there for each other, especially during these times of mourning. Great work, Doug. My heart goes out to the Jewish community. The broke college student is possibly the most prevalent stereotype that exists on college campuses. Despite this norm, it is possible to be on the receiving end, as reported by Rainey Harker of the Arbiter. The Venture College is a resource at Boise State University within the College of Innovation and Design that allows students to become experienced entrepreneurs, whether that means incubating their own businesses or joining startups in the Treasure Valley. The CID can be found on the second floor of the Albertsons Library. There's only one major currently available from the college, gaming, interactive media, and mobile, but it provides countless resources to university students such as WorkU, the Idaho Entrepreneur Challenge, and the Venture College. Complex businesses can be explored through the Venture College Internship Program, where students can see how to run a business effectively and potentially build contacts for their own business. Steve Silva, a Venture College student, began a business called Bowtie Hustle, Bowtie Hustle specializes in collegiate bow tie sales and has even recently partnered with suit companies to expand their sales. The Venture College continues to provide opportunities for students and seeks to open new opportunities every semester. While the Venture College is geared towards majors in the College of Business and Economics, information can be found by anyone interested at the college's website. The appeal of entrepreneurial work may be large for some, but the work can be difficult to balance. With the right resources, students have the opportunity to have the best of both worlds business and academic. When 26 bikes were stolen on Boise State's campus between January 1st and July 6th of this year, Lieutenant Stan Nichols was surprised by the unusually high number, as am I, I feel you Stan, 
Then this fall hit and he says, quote, we've had 29 bikes stolen so far. This is shocking. I've never seen bike thefts this high, end quote. The reasons why this form of petty crime has been so high this year are still up in the air, but the Boise Police Department is working in conjunction with the BSU security team to come up with an answer because I'm waiting. I'm waiting for that answer. A corporation like this is rare on university campuses. According to Nichols, however, he gives Boise State the best of both worlds to curb theft. He says, quote, when you get your bike stolen, it's not just a petty crime, it's a major deal, end quote. He also goes on to state that you lost your way of getting around, it's a major inconvenience, end quote. One of the suspected reasons for the increase in bike theft is Boise's growth rate, population-wise. The city's population has been getting bigger and bigger, and with that comes an increase in crime. Another contributing factor is students locking up their bike incorrectly, or as he puts, not at all. It can really be a crime of opportunity, not locking up your bike somewhere, and just someone super quickly just grabs it, end quote. While there are a million reasons why someone would steal a bike, the security team and the police department are taking serious steps to curb this issue. He also goes on to state, quote, we have our own BSU security officers that take this very seriously, and frankly, personally, these bikes are being stolen. Thank you for the clarification, end quote. Kaplan also goes on to state that he references Stephen Ritter, a bicycle program supervisor on campus, and they're doing a few things to stop the increase in crime. The first is the issue of use of bait bikes. <laughs> bait bikes, never heard this term before, but I'm about to learn it. Scattered around campus to discourage them and arrest thieves. The second is the use of video surveillance around campus to identify the thieves. Well, that's a pretty good idea. He says, quote, we think we know who some of the thieves are right now, end quote. Wow, that's pretty cool. So what can students do to further prevent this issue? The first thing, lock your bikes. Second, use the U-bolt lock. This is an incredibly important prevention tactic, and it is known that your bike will not be taken because they cannot cut metal. According to Nichols, the first thing everyone should do when someone is getting their bike taken is to take a picture of the bike and record the serial number. I hope they find my stolen bike. <laughs> Going green is a major focus for the 21st century, as well a recent reboot of space exploration. What most people don't know is how these two go hand in hand nuclear energy. Last Friday, I headed down to Blackfoot to Idaho National Laboratory's Materials and Fuels Complex, where I interviewed Dr. Stephen Johnson. Dr. Johnson is the Director of Space Nuclear Power and Isotope Technology, one of the many programs at INL. Him and his team are responsible for providing atomic energy for 27 NASA missions, such as both Voyagers and New Horizons. Launched in late 1977, both Voyager 1 and 2 have passed beyond our solar system into interstellar space and traveled at a maximum speed of 38,610 miles per hour. The New Horizon spacecraft is traveling at 36,000 miles per hour and is scheduled to pass into the Kuiper Belt outside of Pluto December 31st of this year to locate possible new planetary bodies. The astonishing speed behind these crafts is exciting in terms of getting astronauts into deep space. As far as getting people to other planets and other moons, I definitely believe that's possible using either uh, nuclear or thermal propulsion or a similar type of technology. Certainly having RTGs along for certain uh, mission specific tasks, definitely doable. And again, the example of the guys taking the RTGs to the moon is a good uh, short term example of that. More information will be coming to your screen soon in Episode 1 of Finding Beyond on how atomic energy will propel humans into space and how it can save Earth. But for now, keep your eyes to the skies. Athletes here at Boise State are expected to be inhuman, and they all make mistakes. However, when it comes down to it, mental health is not just an issue focused on homeless people or other people that have issues. It is focused on athletes right here at Boise State, and especially when playing their sport. As a result, there are many factors that are contributing to mental health at Boise State, and one of them is helmet-to-helmet -helmet contact. 
The Boise State Athletics Association was selected as one of the 15 universities throughout the country to host a, quote, same here, sit down, on Sunday, October 28th. Organized by the Global Health Alliance, they say, quote, we're all a little crazy. This is an area that has grown by leaps and bounds. 10, 15 years ago, heck, even five years ago, mental health wasn't really addressed or talked about, quote, said by Mark Paul, associate athletic director and head athletic trainer at BSU. Quote, especially with this much publicity behind it, and now it's becoming the thing to talk about, that's a good thing. I agree with you. End quote. The same here sit down included former professional athletes, musicians, artists, and members of the news media. They had honest conversations with student athletes about their ongoing battles with mental health, what they do to deal with it, and most importantly, they told student athletes that it is okay to not be okay. Yep. And that it is okay to talk openly about their mental health. Boise State hired Stephanie Donaldson, a mental health specialist, this past summer. She and the Broncos Athletic Association have aimed to start focusing on mental health and suicide prevention for student athletes. She quotes, I think first and foremost, we were trying to open the topic and have a conversation about mental health and start openly talking about struggles that everyone goes through, including athletes. Donaldson also said that talking about mental health as a continuum at some point in your life, whether personally or someone that you know, everyone struggles with mental health, end quote. The event featured a Q&A at the end of a presentation so that student athletes could open up about what they're going through or ask the former athletes question about their own struggles. Since the event, the BSU Athletic Association has already received a tremendous amount of positive feedback from both coaches and athletes. As reported by the Arbiters Autumn Robertson, the Boise State football organization recently started an anti-bullying campaign called Broncos vs. Bullying. The campaign was put together to teach children about bullying, respect, and kindness. Player development coordinator Winston Venable helped bring the campaign to life, selecting a group of about 20 people made up of staff and athletes to go to elementary schools and give their anti-bullying message to the children. Venable shared his difficulty in narrowing down his panel selection, seeing that so many players are good-hearted and well-qualified candidates. He based his selection on the players he felt were the most natural leaders, comfortable around children, and aware of the impact their words have on the community. Venable said he has had other athletes ask to be part of this, and he will never turn anyone down who wants to make a difference. Bronco football head coach Brian Harson has children of his own who have witnessed bullying at their schools, making him more aware of how big of a problem it is. Because of this, Harson has been pushing for a program or campaign that deals with bullying. Harson stressed the necessity of the campaign, noting that most Boise State attendees collectively recognize that bullying holds no place within our Bronco community. The Bronco football organization does a lot for the community, such as the charity softball game that benefits the first tee of Idaho. They have a firm understanding of the impact they can make. The Broncos vs. Bullying campaign was a step up from the community service that they already do. The organization wanted to make more of a lasting impact on the youth. The Broncos decided to kick off the campaign in October for National Bullying Prevention Month, but the Broncos have no intentions of stopping. They have schools lined up to visit all through November and have plans of continuing at least until the end of the 2018 season. That is awesome. What a cool story to come in to Newsline. Wouldn't mm -hmm. you agree? I agree. It's a great project. Definitely. Now we're going to send it on over to our sports guy, Brendan Serrano. Now, I don't know if any of you know this, but his nickname is Pepper. So what do we got, Pepper? Thanks, guys. Yes, it was a fantastic game on the blue last Saturday night where a near sellout crowd and the Mountain West leader in attendance witnessed your Broncos defeat the Cougars of BYU 21-16. to Boise State coming into Saturday night's contest riding a three-game winning streak and looking to make it four against a budding yet fierce rivalry with the BYU Cougars. The Broncos came into the contest off of a 48-38 victory over Air Force, led once again by an efficient game from senior quarterback Brett Rippon, who went 23-35 of 35 for 214 yards with one touchdown and one pick. Rippon has been a steady guiding force this season, and his statistics show just that. He is in the top 10 in the nation in passing yards, touchdowns, and completion percentage. A.J. Richardson had also had himself a decent night and was on the receiving end of Rippon's one touchdown and also added 53 yards to lead the team. 
Alexander Madison was held under 100 yards again, once again, but did manage to find the end zone twice, which brought his overall season total to 10. This was the second game in a row at home where Boise State was outgained in terms of offensive yards, with BYU having 388 to Boise BSU's 327. But once again, the defense came up huge. The turnover thrown was alive and well Saturday, with the defense coming up with three total turnovers, all of which were fumbles. However, the turnover margin was overshadowed by the Broncos' relentless effort getting to the quarterback. True freshman Zach Wilson of BYU was sacked a total of seven times by five different players. Curtis Weaver was in the backfield the most, tallying two sacks and seven to overall tackles, which tied for the team lead. Avery Williams, Jabril Frazier, and Riley Wimpy all had seven tackles as well. Now, not all was, defense, was dominant, however, on defense, as BYU was able to get into the red zone in the final seconds of the game, but the bend but don't break mentality of the defense came out again and collected a huge sack as the clock expired to preserve the victory. Now speaking of Wimpy, there was some bad news after Saturday's contest when it was revealed that, the, that he suffered a torn ACL and will miss the remainder of the season. Now coming into the 2018 season, the storyline was who will replace Leighton Vanderesh, who was taken with the 17th overall pick in the 2018 NFL Draft. But Wimpy stepped up and has led the team in total tackles up to this point. After the game, Coach Harson, Brett Rippon, Jabril Frazier, Alexander Madison, and Curtis Weaver shared their thoughts on the victory. Pretty exciting game, wasn't it? And our guys at the end, bottom line, we found a way to win. They, sh they displayed a lot of guts. And we made one more play than they did to win the game. And I would say this, I'm really proud of our team. A lot of respect for BYU, always do. Uh, their kids played extremely hard. It was, uh, it was an interesting game. There was a lot of momentum changes and I would say stoppage of momentum with penalties and um, a lot of yellow hankies on the field tonight. So we'll go back and look at that. But it was, uh, it was an interesting game from that standpoint. Um, but at the end, they made big plays. They got down there in the red zone. We got them on the goal line and kind of got ourselves in position and found a way to get it done. You know, winning these close games, I think, builds more team chemistry and camaraderie than, you know, blowing people out by 40. Maybe it's not as pretty as everybody wants it to be, but at the end of the day, we're winning, and, um, you know, we're winning tough games, which is what you want coming down coming down the uh, later half of the season, especially when we got some big games coming up here. Yeah, that was big for us, you know. We had some adversity. They was able to move the ball, but we, like we said, we had our backs against the wall. And Coach Avalos always talks about if they don't score, if we don't let them score, all that we can uh, let them end up with a three point. And that's what we try to do every single time is just let, let them get the field goal. Uh, we're brothers uh, day in and day out, and uh, it shows up. It shows up. We, we love each other and we play for each other. The man on the left, the man on the right. And uh, you can see it, that passion when we play. Oh, I was. Um, I asked him what he had for lunch yesterday, but nothing crazy. I'm not trash talking. I'm not that type of person. Is that what you normally do? Do you normally ask Yeah, them? yeah. Or what, what's their favorite book? Yeah. You know, a book uh, makes your life better. Coach Harson said. Do they ever give you honest answers? Um, I don't know. They be pre they pretty mean most of the time. They don't like answering the question. I don't know why. <laughs> It is a quick turnaround this week, and boy is it a big one on the blue, as the 16th ranked Fresno State Bulldogs come to town in what is without a doubt the biggest game to this point for Boise State. It is also the first time Boise State is a home underdog since 2001 when they welcomed Washington State. Coverage of the game can be seen on ESPN2 with kickoff slated for 815. Guys? Wow. I mean, I was in attendance and the game was a nail biter. What did you think about it, Lily? I thought it was exciting. I think. The season kicked off and it's been exciting up until now and I don't doubt it will continue being exciting. Agreed. Now let's toss it over to Jimena Bustillo has a story about Hurricane Tutu. On Thursday, October 25th, Category 5 Typhoon U2 reached the United States territory of Saipan in what was soon recorded as the worst storm to land on United States soil since 1935. The 180 mile per hour winds left the island of Saipan, home to over 20 Boise State Broncos, with broken infrastructure, damaged schools and homes, and minimal gas and internet access. However, while the island is grappling with devastation, the children of many families stand idle on Boise State's campus. A donation bin will remain on the ASBSU offices located within the second floor of the Student Union Building in the Student Involvement and Leadership Center. There you can donate any items from clothes, towels to soap. 
Back to you. Wow, that is really cool, Jimena. Well, I mean, Lily, what kind of weather are you expecting? Is it going to be cold? I mean, give me some of your thoughts. I have now embraced the cold weather physically, but not emotionally. Wow, getting real. Getting really real on camera here. Well, it looks like we're going to send it on over to Sam Orozco with our weekly weather. What do we got, Sam? Thank you, Doug. So as of now, it's 49 degrees, but feels like 44, so be sure to have a jacket on. On Thursday and Friday, it's going to be sunny with a high of... 47 on Thursday and a, and a high of 49 on Friday. On Saturday, it'll be mostly sunny with a high of 49 and a low of 24. On Sunday and Monday, um, it's going to be sunny but cold, so be sure to have some sunglasses on and a winter jacket. On Tuesday, it'll be partly cloudy with a high of 49 and a low of 28. And on Wednesday, we will see some showers, so grab that umbrella and stay dry out there. That's it for this week. Back to you guys. Well, that's all the time we have. Thanks for joining us. I'm Doug Mason. And I'm Lily Corolius. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.